Hello there. Don't have a good day. Have a great day. Talk to me, Goose. Precious. You steal the Declaration of Independence. Why so serious? I could do this all day. Are you watching closely? Welcome, everybody, to the One Eyed Film Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Mossberg, and I got Josh and Zach with me today to talk about Iron Man and the character that he gives to the MCU and all of the different aspects that he affected that storyline for so many years. We're going to be talking in depth about his trilogy, all his cameos, and then the culmination of the MCU for the 10 years in Infinity War and Endgame and his role that he had in that. Thank you boys for joining me. I'm excited to have this conversation with you guys. Thanks for having us. So obviously Iron Man has been kind of the glue that has held the MCU together because he started off the MCU with his first two movies right away. And RDJ really embodied this character through and through. We'll talk about how he kind of lived the life of Tony Stark a little bit later, but as a character, what are your guys' thoughts on him? You can even expand into like the comics if there are some variations of him or just what the mcu did what, what do you guys think initially i think iron man's character is definitely just cocky and i didn't like him at first <laughs> i didn't really have any idea of what was going on in the comics but his character in the mcu it was well portrayed as just being some rich billionaire playboy philanthropist he was really good at being that and to the point where me and a lot of my family who just watched the movies just didn't really like him because of how cocky he was. But also, that slowly develops and actually being pretty much the team leader towards the end of his career in the MCU. And I just think his place there is so monumental. It was great. And even though I may not have liked the guy, it was one of the one of the reasons that I kept on coming back to the MCU because of how great Iron Man 1, 2, and 3 were. Now, I wasn't a huge fan of Iron Man 3, but still, it was all just fun, entertaining, even though it was obviously some guy who was super full of himself. But you saw the character. You saw the development, and it was fun. Yeah, I think for most of Phase 1, he's like mostly meant to be you know, the unlikable, selfish jerk. And then once we get to like Iron Man 3 is where we see him, like we see a different side to him. Just like after what he's experienced from the Battle of New York and the toll that had on him, we see him learn humility and what happens when he doesn't have his resources or his money and what it truly means to be Iron Man. And then we kind of see that story continue throughout uh, Homecoming and Civil War into Infinity War and Endgame just you know like there's a whole proof that Tony has a heart which was the original reactor from Iron Man 1 and just that being kind of the kind of his main arc I mean even from even from the first Iron Man we kind of saw that he had a, just like layers of like unlikable selfish jerk but then at the core there there was something there to him and just throughout his arc from Iron Man to Endgame, we just see a lot of those layers get stripped away and we see him truly become the hero that he's meant to be. There's a lot of deep things that can come from the character of Iron Man, and that's why I'm excited to talk about this. There's a lot of symbolism yeah. from his upgrading of suits. You know, I think a lot of people have realized this. Every time he gets a new suit, he's upgraded something from a mistake that he made in the past, whether it's heating his suit after Iron Man 3 getting stuck in the winter or his nanotech after, you know, pieces of his suit wasn't working or his suit flying to him and all that, that, that progression of making his suit better and almost troubleshooting in the field where he doesn't realize he needs that element until it happens to him and then he fixes it in his next variation of the suit. But he also grows as a character very, very obviously. That's his character arc throughout all the movies that he appeared in. He's supposed to be the the rich kid who's grown up and continued the lifestyle of not caring and just living life and very selfish. He was a very selfish character at the very beginning. And that is so contrasted by how we know his story ends, sacrificing himself for the universe and knowing that he might not come back from the snap when he takes all the infinity stones and snaps. He, he, knows that there's a very low chance that he's going to survive that. But he's adopted this hero mentality. And you even see that when he finally escapes from the Ten Rings at the very beginning of the first movie and is inspired to make more sophisticated Iron Man suits, is that he kind of embraces the hero mentality and wanting to do something for others and instead of just always be about himself. That's the arc of the first movie, and that's just exemplified more as the movies go on until Endgame. He, he's essentially the modern Solomon. He's got the smarts, he's got the women, he's got the wealth, but he's spiritually dead. He's, he knows it's not mm -hmm. enough. He has that God-sized hole that everyone has, 
that, that is built into us as humans that was taken from us when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and out of the presence of God where they walked with him every day. We have that desire to fill that hole with something God-sized. And we, we try to do that with those things that Tony tries to do with relationships, with wealth, with just knowledge about things, or with other little G gods that are just trying to fill the hole of needing something more. And we'll actually talk about this next week when we cover a movie that recently came out, Jesus Revolution. That was a very good movie. You'll hear more about that next week, but the only thing that can fill the God-sized hole is God. And Tony doesn't necessarily get there in this movie, but he was trying so hard to fill himself with all those things that wouldn't satisfy him. And eventually he realized he needs to be putting work into others. Like I said, he doesn't find God in the movies, but he sort of finds it when he's putting focus on others and saving them and being the superhero with his big man in the suit of armor persona. Well, unlike Josh, Iron Man 3 is actually like my favorite Iron Man film. Ooh. And yeah. Hot take. <laughs> got some got some controversy I, here. I, I really love the film. And one one thing I think's really cool about the movie is just kind of said how he's a modern Solomon, you know, the man who has everything. Back in Avengers when Cap says you're not the one to lay down on the wire for somebody else. And then Tony Stark says, I would just cut the wire. That's because he has everything and he could do that. In Iron Man 3, we see all of that stripped away from him and like who he truly is when he doesn't have the power and the money and ev- all the worldly things like that. So we see him truly have to find out who he is and who Iron Man truly is and use that to save the world instead of relying on his technology and his money. Yeah, Tony would have never made the sacrifice play that he did in Endgame at the very end of Iron Man 1. He he just wasn't developed the same way. Like, yes, he still had that that hero persona to kind of sacrifice for, mostly for Pepper, and he didn't really care about the universe at that point. It was a little too small of a scope. But it took all of these movies to develop him and grow him into the selfless Tony Stark that would make that sacrifice play that Cap said he would never make in the first Avengers. I also want to say that I have pretty pitiful reasons for not liking Iron Man 3. I, I'm not going to deny it. it was actually really good. Uh, the storyline <laughs> great. And just actually seeing character development in Iron Man was really good. But I was just really disappointed because I wanted to see a lot more of a showcase of all of his suits. Mm-hmm. Rather than them all showing up at the end. I remember watching the trailers and seeing like a Hulkbuster-ish suit. And then I was like, oh, oh my yeah. goodness, they're actually going to show off all of these awesome suits that I remember seeing on Instagram of people saying, like, this is what this suit is, this is what this suit is. So I was just disappointed with the lack of yeah. CGI given to those suits. Mm. So it kind of a petty reason to not like Iron Man 3 because it, all things considered, it actually was really, really good. I just have a hard time getting past me or my 12-year-old self wanting all of that so it just didn't stick right right away my disappointment is immeasurable it it really (laughs) was at the time i want to talk about tony's heart for a second he obviously has shrapnel damage and needs the arc reactor to pull the shrapnel away from his chest and then he makes it better and then he gets removed and all that but trying trying to protect his heart through artificial means and trying to solve a life or death problem he, he found out that it was never permanent especially in iron man 3 he had to keep switching out his arc reactors because it was getting too dangerous but it's always temporary and the connection i want to suggest to our biblical foundation and our spiritual development through that example is something that proverbs 4 23 says speaking of solomon one of his proverbs above all else guard your heart for everything you do flows from it bars Bars. (laughs) i was waiting for it that was really good it is a that is a very solid verse oh you could say that the you could say the Holy Spirit's like a spiritual arc reactor. How so? Uh, in the sense that, you know, it guards your heart like that. I don't know. Sin is the that. shrapnel trying to get exactly. to your heart, trying to kill you. And our hearts, and our hearts are made clean through the Holy Spirit. It's not yeah. just once. It's a constant renewal because yeah. he's constantly pulling the shrapnel away with that arc reactor. And same how the Holy Spirit is constantly redeeming us because we're always sinful. Yep. I agree. Did you just bars yourself? (laughs) Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Spin facts. I definitely agree with that. That's a great analogy that sin is the shrapnel that is going closer to our heart. And naturally, that is 
why we must guard our heart is because we will always tend towards sin. Yeah. And if people allow that shrapnel to get to their heart, their spiritual heart, they will really just be living a life of sin that is never healthy and never fruitful. Another verse I want to bring into this is Luke six forty five. A good man brings good things out of the good stored in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And that connects back to the proverb that was talking about how just from your heart, you, you show who you really are. And if you are living in sin and having that shrapnel eat away at your heart and it's it's damaged, it will show. Whereas if you have the Holy Spirit, the arc reactor in inside of you pulling that shrapnel away, then then that will that will show. Like you will be healthier as Tony was healthier if you want to keep using that analogy. And it will keep your heart from being damaged and it'll keep you alive, spiritually alive. With the comparison between the arc reactor and the Holy Spirit is that the arc reactor had to be constantly replaced. So I would rather say that the arc reactor is the artificial and fake ways that we try and keep our lives mm. healthy. And we have to keep you know, replacing it and needing new solutions or just trying the same thing, but a better, you know, newer version. And the only way that Tony was actually able to live without worry is to have that shrapnel removed. And Jesus' sacrifice for us is what does that. It will not remove sin as it did for Tony with the shrapnel, but it'll keep the shrapnel out of there only through being justified and declaring us righteous without sin will allow us to have a clean heart. Now we still have have to deal with sin. And this is where the analogy kind of falls apart. But only through removing sin will we ever be free. And through justification, we can have that in our lives. I got a question. Why do you guys think Tony Stark is not happy? Because he has a God-sized hole and he doesn't have God. Now that's the Christian in me coming out. I don't think you can ever truly be happy without the fulfillment you get from the Lord. Iron Man, he had everything. And he was very much so, like, playing into all of these different sins. He was going after lust, money. But then eventually, he found a family and he found his happiness and kind of happy ending there. But I would ultimately say that he didn't die truly happy because he doesn't have what he, we have. Within the universe of the story, I, I would argue that uh, Tony Stark is happy like at the beginning of iron man one before he goes before he gets kidnapped and all that but i think he, joy is what he's lacking because he's finding happiness in worldly things such as money women and power rather than in the relationships around him so i think as the movies progress we see him we see him go from the happiness of the world to the joy from the relationships around him and you see him develop and care for people more than we originally did at the beginning of the first iron man and on that note closer to the end of his story arc he starts to care more about two people three people depending on how you want to math yes he starts caring for pepper but he also has morgan to care about and a new mm -hmm. daughter that is something that i didn't see coming but it's really cute addition to let him have a daughter and to yeah. be able to finally settle down and foster this child and raise her like the dad that he envied for most of his life his his dad was both very successful and yet very distant and he had that moment with his past dad when he time traveled back in endgame where he kind of had that heartfelt moment of father to father but also father to son something i also want to mention is with his character development way back in the beginning we know that the old iron man from one two maybe a little bit of three would have dropped everything he was doing to go on the mission that cap had brought up to him in endgame but he had a family he had his happy ending there and within all means he had the right to just stay there but as he was working, he actually came up with a solution to freaking time travel. <laughs> and he has to debate it because he doesn't necessarily want to go on this mission because he'd have to be giving up what he's found his satisfaction in life in, which is his family. And also very mature of him to make another sacrifice there because he understands that he's gotten comfortable in the life that he has, but he'd have to be giving up that life if he did go on this mission. Because you don't just bring back half of the population of the world in your life be unaffected. So he would have to give up part of the life that he was living and loved and found fulfillment in if he went on the mission. And I would argue that him going on the mission is more selfless than his initial sacrifice at the very end. I think about a lot the line from Ant-Man actually where Hank says we're not fighting to save our world, we're fighting to save theirs. And how 
during most of his early arc in the Iron Man 1 and 2. We see him just living for for praise and for just, you know, gaining power and money and women. But then we flash all the way to Endgame, and when he enters the final battle, he pretty much knows he's not going to make it through. But he's he's still willing to make the sacrifice, because when he does the snap, it's not his own world that he's saving. It's the, it's the world of pepper and morgan and everyone else that he cares about and i i would like to think that iron man or tony stark at that point understood that very much so that he wasn't trying to save his friends that he was battling with around him he was probably thinking back to his daughters and pepper who he was truly trying to save not his own skin in that final snap it was very evident in endgame that he was meant to be the christ figure of that story i think it's it's one of the most obvious things is that sacrificing himself for the sake of not only his friends and family that he knows personally, but half of the population that came back. And yes, that created a bunch of problems that we have kind of seen addressed a little bit in phase four, but those lives were not meaningless. And he kind of knew that. It's not that he did that for that reason, but he knew that bringing them back was worth more than his life. The other person that I mentioned earlier that he starts pouring his knowledge into was Peter Parker. And the mentorship that he had starting in Civil War, a little bit in Homecoming, and then a little bit in Infinity War, and then post-mortem in Far From Home, kind of through Happy a little bit, through some memories and all that. Specifically Homecoming, what did you guys think of his inclusion in the story of Spider-Man? This is going to be really controversial, and I'm going to stand my ground with it because... I love Spider-Man, and I love his origin story, and I love the idea of Spider-Man being incredibly smart, witty, funny, and making all of his own gadgets. That was big for me in, I know they didn't do that great in making these films, but The Amazing Spider-Man, I loved those movies because of how clever Spider-Man is in them. I think Andrew Garfield is the best Spider-Man, but the worst universe, (laughs) I will admit. But I think Tony Stark took away that part of Spider-Man that I liked and was huge in my book. So for me personally, I'm going to say it boldly, I don't like Tony Stark's involvement with Peter Parker. Wow, that's really interesting. But it does make sense. It does make sense for the MCU. That's a really interesting stance to take, and I understand it. We will talk about Spider-Man, the character, and all of his variations in another episode. But I totally get what you're saying, though, is that the self-made Spider-Man wasn't shown as much as he could have. I would argue Mm -hmm. that it was, that type of Spider-Man was shown in Homecoming, mostly at the end where he has his old suit. Not saying that we saw him make that, but he did use that in the final fight. And that, I think, was an incredible fight. When We're getting off topic. I understand yeah, your sentiment. Yeah. Uh, I think Tony worked as a great mentor for Peter. I, 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 I also wasn't the biggest fan of how he just provided him with all this tech. I think it would have been better to see Tony, like, encourage Peter as he created his own tech instead. Well, I, I think the, the Iron Spider suit, I mean, sh- should have been made by Tony. And it, I mean, it was, but we shouldn't have seen Tony give him all these other suits that we saw. It should have been more of a self-made Peter Parker than that. And that's why, kind of like you were saying, Seth, I think Homecoming really starts to get great once he loses his suit. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Once we see him actually, like, fight with what he's actually got. And we see, you know, like, there, there's a whole line, if you're nothing without the suit, then you shouldn't have it. And just see him, like, be something without the suit. I think that's... Kind of, you know, like what Spider-Man's meant to be right there. So, mm-hmm. yep. I think back to Infinity War and Endgame, those those two times that we sat in the movie and had our minds absolutely blown. And specifically in Infinity War, the final fight with Thanos is something else. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. And when he gets stabbed at the very end, I flinched. I jumped. I don't really remember. It was some <laughs> sort of shock, but yeah. it was crazy. That sort of... It, it, it almost hinted at his sacrifice in the next yeah. movie, which we obviously didn't know by then. But the thought that this man that we've seen fight and win for so long is mortal and mm-hmm. has the ability to be wounded. And the fight that he put up against Thanos was really great because he was the only one who made Thanos bleed. <laughs> and, dude... I, I, that scene gives me chills. I know. And I think that's best cgi fight of all time and i will defend that he just goes ham on thanos yeah and then you also think back to was it obadiah stain in the first movie 
who had said, if you can make a god bleed, people will cease to believe in him. Great callback. Oh, uh, that's that's from Iron Man 2. Is it Iron Man what, 2? Is it yeah. Oh, no. That that's, uh, Russian guy. Yeah, I forgot what his name was. Whiplash. But, yeah, Whiplash. That callback was awesome. And yeah. I think that was probably one of the most popular lines in Iron Man 2. So watching Endgame, I got even more chills on top of the chills I already had mm -hmm. from seeing the blood come out of Thanos and thinking back to that line in the mm -hmm. theater. And that was just so cool. I'm a little disappointed with the solution to him getting stabbed and it's just nanotech spray. But even those few seconds of him acting stabbed because he was the character was stabbed mm -hmm. but just almost convulsing and about to lose blood but then he heals himself blah 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 but that again shows us that he's mortal and can only take so much i think another cool thing about his story is about how the phrase just i am iron man evolves from first iron man to iron man 3 and then end game when he says it in iron man it's very much a thing of pride because he just thinks he's so cool now because <laughs> he's got a cool flying suit. And then in Iron Man 3, it changes because he learns who Iron Man is without the suit. Even if he doesn't have everything, as we talked about earlier, he can still do good for the world. And then in Endgame, it's ultimately a, a line of sacrifice because it's what it truly means to be a hero is to lay yourself down on the wire for everyone else. It's also a snarky comment to Thanos because he says, I am inevitable. And then he's like, and I am Iron oh, yeah. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Callbacks, I tell you. Backing up a little bit, his involvement in Civil War, his his stance, the whole reason we had Team Cat versus Team Iron Man. First off, I'm, I'm interested to hear what team you're on. And then I want to hear if you think Tony was justified in his thoughts, both with Bucky and his parents and then with the Sokovia Accords. I completely forgot about Civil War. Uh, <laughs> is that a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> either one honestly <laughs> iron man was fighting for sokovia accords right yes and cap was against it correct yep okay it's it is a really hard choice there's pros and cons for each side i would say i'm 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 more team cap just yeah just they should have it's i don't know it is a very philosophical debate i guess but. i think it makes sense why it would divide the team so much because of how difficult of a choice it is to make yeah i mean you can't just have a bunch of vigilantes running loose but in the same time you know you saw what happened in winter soldier and you can't completely trust the government with everything either so mm. there's gotta be a middle ground you can find but that's not the easiest thing to find so yeah that's why we see them so divided i would say with what we saw in winter soldier i would be more team cap but I understand why some would see the need for the Sokovia Accords. I saw someone on online post about how there was a huge solution to it. Tony would just buy some island, claim it as his own country because he could very easily fund that. And then they would be completely off of the grid from any other country. Then there was <laughs> huge legal loophole that they were going through. But yeah, it is a toss up honestly, but I would probably be Team Iron Man, even though I don't believe that the government can be trusted with a ton of really powerful people like that. But it does make sense to me that even though you can trust like Captain America to not kill everyone that he walks down the street with, he still has the power to do that and he has killed many people and you would have to restrain some force like that in some way. Yeah. Just for the same reason you don't let nukes just wander around. Not that nukes wander, but you need to have a lot of protocol for them because of how powerful they are. Oh, yeah, there's a line in Civil War where they're talking about Thor and Hulk. And they're like, it's like the government lost two nukes because nobody knew where, the, where they were at the time. So yeah. yeah, can't just lose two nukes like that. I think compared to the other superhero versus superhero movie that came out that year, Batman versus Superman, Civil War actually <laughs> had a lot better grounds and had... Yeah. It maybe wasn't the best one, but it actually had conflict in how they were trying to figure this out because as we're talking about this there is probably a middle ground that they could have found but either mm -hmm. extreme is probably not the answer why do you guys think that tony stark did choose to be pro sokovia Accords? it was at the beginning where he was realizing oh with yeah the, with the mother who lost her son in sokovia and he realized that they needed to kind of be tamed and yeah he took it personally basically it just seems like with the resentment that he had for the government before the movie, it just seemed really out of place for him to be the one pro Sokovia Accords. 
Mm -hmm. I think Civil War was one of the biggest character developments that we saw from him, especially towards the end. I think that's where Mm -hmm. he kind of established what he believed. And then Homecoming, Infinity War, and Endgame, it was all kind of a reaction to that. And you could kind of see that in Homecoming, where he was trying to still play up his his billionaire persona of not caring, but he could also tell that he really did care and that he had changed but didn't want to show it. But that really came to a head with the revelation that Bucky had killed his parents and how he kind of stopped thinking straight. Like anyone who could comprehend the situation could understand that Bucky had been brainwashed and wasn't in control at that point. And yet it seems so irrational for Tony to go off on both Cap and Bucky and fight them. Obviously you need a fight in the movie. That's kind of the point. Yeah. But I wonder if they sacrificed his logical thought process and thinking through things in- deeply for the sake of just a superhero beatdown. It's also hard to tell what what kind of emotions you would have when you find out that one of your best friends' best friends killed your parents. Mm. That's monumental news. Yeah. I, and I definitely know that I would not be keeping calm in that situation. I'd at least want to give the guy a slap on the wrist or something. Maybe not a full beatdown, but... <laughs> yeah. I I do understand where it would come into play that he would become aggressive because I haven't lost my parents and I am so thankful that I haven't, but I do know that I would go crazy mm. if I found out that the person who killed them was with me, regardless of what excuses they had. Yeah. To give some, I don't know, devil's advocate for the plot. Civil War did do a lot of great things for both Steve and Tony's characters and introduced both Spider-Man and Black Panther. I do think it's still probably one of the most overrated mcu films mm. i think especially when you get to the airport battle it just seems like none of them are taking it seriously i mean there's even like the dialogue between hawkeye and black widow where they're like are we still friends it depends on how hard you hit me it's just like there, there just doesn't seem to be much stakes especially since that's supposed to be like kind of like the main event of the film is that airport battle where just there's no stakes and there's I mean, you expect someone to die in a war. The most we get is just Bodhi getting injured, so. And a Star Wars reference. Yeah. That was pretty big. I do think that the plot of Civil War was a little bit rushed to get to the fight between Cap and Iron Man, because I do think that's what a lot of people came to Civil War for. That was a huge question, like, who would win, Batman or Superman? Huge controversial question, (laughs) similar. Who would win, Iron Man or Captain America? I know everyone was talking about that specific fight, and I think they wanted to get to it, which is why I think they didn't give as thought about the dialogue in the airport battle, which I wish they would have, because there's a lot of better questions there in who would win in a fight. But that's just what I collected from watching it. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that RDJ kind of followed the path of Tony Stark's life as well. And I want to talk about that a little bit. RDJ had been in prison for a little bit and he got out and wanted to make a better life for himself. And he really built himself from the ground up and became one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood right now. And that's a testament to the character he plays. It's very fitting that he he made that happen for himself and that John Favreau gave him specifically this role because he knew he would be perfect because he would embody the character so well. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways... The first Iron Man was like a last chance for both Marvel Studios, or Marvel in general, and Robert Downey Jr., because Marvel was going bankrupt at the time, and trying to, trying to start a cinematic universe was kind of like their last, their last play, and we see how that paid off for both Marvel and Robert Downey Jr. in big ways, to the point where it got hard for Marvel to afford Robert Downey Jr. in the end because of what they did for him. Yeah, I think Robert Downey fully understood the possibility that could come from this film. So like all of the stakes that he put back in at the very beginning, he knew they would pay off and very smart marketing decision on him to be requesting a percentage of profits towards the end because he knew that it would be big, but he didn't want a solid number. He wanted that number to be changing. But I do think it's kind of cool that his fictional character, his actual Robert Downey himself and the universe that he's playing in, like the production studio Marvel was all going through basically the same character development and going from dead or at least close to death, making a name for themselves, progressing, and then eventually becoming something awesome. It's just so cool. Agreed. One last thing that I want to present to you guys. A lot of people have been talking about Marvel moving forward, and I want to ask you if you would bring back RDJ Tony Stark 
at any point in the future. Not as the same one that we've seen. Hmm. I, I could see them doing alternate universe one, and I think that could work. But there's no way that I want to see, like, the one we've seen come back, because that would just completely make his sacrifice worthless. So I don't, I don't want that. I am a strong believer in good endings. And I yeah. think Endgame was a very good ending. As much as I loved the content, all good things must come to an end. That was a good thing, and it came to an end. That's just how it is. We don't need more. The insignificance and of death has been really pushed in these last few movies that we've seen. But to have him come back would just undermine anything that you ever felt watching Endgame and any of the far from home feelings that Peter Parker felt and any grieving that happened after that. It just would make it seem irrelevant. And that's why I don't think it's a good idea to bring him back. But they are trying really hard to bring Iron Man back, or at least Iron Heart, through Riri Williams. I hope they realize that it's not the Iron Man character or anyone wearing a suit of armor like Iron Man's that makes them popular. It was RDJ, and it's what made him embody the character like we just talked about so well and understand that you can't replace that and just say, hey, here's a new Iron Man suit and somebody else is in it, fall in love with her and think that she's the best thing ever just like you did with RDJ. No, it was this actor that you just need to leave alone and mm -hmm. have that death of Tony Stark that rocked the world mean something. And yet with our savior, he didn't stay dead. And that's what's so great <laughs> is that he came back to life and we have hope. And what's so awesome is the death still means a whole lot. Exactly. Mm -hmm. with, that's that's the so very crazy. opposite. That's the opposite of what happens with Tony Stark. Like thematically and dramatically, bringing him back to life would mean nothing. With yeah. Jesus, it means everything. And that's awesome. Yeah. Now there's a character arc I love. <laughs> that's why I wasn't the biggest fan of the end of Wakanda Forever. Spoilers, I guess, for the film if you haven't seen it. At the end of Wakanda Forever, there's basically three Iron Men flying around. Yep. And it's like, what's really? the point of this? Well, one of them's Iron Heart, and two of them are like these Wakandan soldiers, like the Dora Milaje, who have these like new suits. But yeah, they nice. they look just like Iron Man suits on the inside, with the layout and the screens around him, around around them. So yeah. it's just so they, like, can we uh, can we just move kind of past? Annoying. Can we move past Iron Man? I mean, just honor his legacy without mimicking what you've already done. That's a little frustrating. Yeah, we'll talk about the future of the MCU in a little bit. Thank you guys so much for talking with me about Tony Stark and the great character that he was to hold the MCU together for all those years. And apparently that's all it took was losing him and then it all falls apart. But I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you guys so much. If you listener want to join in the conversation, join our Discord. We'll talk about it more over there. Subscribe on YouTube where we have video podcasts. Also follow our Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube where we have short form content. We got a great community that you can join and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, Zach and Josh, for joining me today. With that said, we love you guys. Have a great day. God bless. Peace out. Peace. Peace.